Now I want to preface tonight's broadcast again with I'm not trying to destroy anybody's religion. I don't care what you believe in. But I want to bring to light and point out to you certain deceptions. If you hear this broadcast and you wish to hold to those beliefs, even though you know they're deceptions, or you may disagree and, and believe that they're not deceptions, that's okay with me. Nothing wrong with that. If, however, in holding to those deceptions, you are attempting to destroy my beliefs, or this great nation, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, which protect what I believe and many others believe, are our natural, God-given rights. Then eventually we will face each other upon a battlefield, physically and spiritually. So all I ask of anyone is that they understand the meaning, the true meaning of freedom. And if you are a true American, that you practice that belief in freedom. And that you practice the greatest, the really the only rule that Jesus Christ and many other great men in the history of the world has given us, and that is simply do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I live, ladies and gentlemen, in Mormon territory. And just to the north of the great state of Arizona is an entire state populated by believers and members of the Mormon church. I know many adherents to the Mormon faith personally, and they are good, honest, wonderful people. I don't believe that any one of these people that I know would ever hurt a fly knowingly for any reason whatsoever. So, with that preface said and done, I want you to pay very close attention to tonight's broadcast. Mormonism is a marvelously composite faith. It has developed over a period of time, and as it went along, it took over some of the most divergent elements from other sects and groups, including Freemasonry, which probably was the root of the whole theosophy of the Mormon Church. They brewed a synthetic religion, ladies and gentlemen, in Utah, which began on the eastern seaboard in the early 1800s. The Mormon prophet, Joseph Smith, Jr., was born on December the 23rd, 1805, in Sharon, Vermont. He was reared in ignorance, poverty, and superstition. Moreover, he was indolent in his youth. However, quite in keeping with the superstitious atmosphere in which he breathed, he claimed to have visions and divine revelations as early as 1820 and 1823. In the latter year, 1823, the angel Moroni revealed to him, so he says, the spot where golden plates lay buried containing the history of ancient America in Reformed Egyptian characters. Reformed Egyptian characters was a term that he created. Smith undoubtedly meant characters, not C-A-R-A-C-T-O-R-S as he spelled it. but characters, C-H-A-R-A-C-T-E-R-S. <laughs> but unlike Mother Eddie, and we'll get into depth about her some other night, 
Mary Baker Eddy. He had never known enough grammar for it to be eclipsed by a divine revelation. Hence, he made occasional grammatical errors, which cannot be overlooked. In 1830, Joe, as he was known, organized the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at Fayette, New York. This, ladies and gentlemen, he accomplished after having convinced a few friends that his translation of the Golden Plates, afterward duly returned into the hands of the angel Moroni, had been done not as was maliciously slandered with the aid of a peep stone in a hat, but with the assistance of the proper Urim and Thummim, which the obliging angel had so thoughtfully provided. The plates are stated to have been hidden in the earth from the year 420 of our era until September 22, 1823, when Joe Smith discovered them in the Hill Kumora. And yet, the Book of Mormon being a faithful rendering of the said plates, gives extensive quotations from the Bible in, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, the King James Version. How could that be? <laughs> it contains modern phrases and ideas that could not have been known to its supposed author in 420 A.D., long before the King James Version was ever conceived, much less written. It puts the words of Jesus though often twisted into the mouths of men alleged to have lived centuries before Christ. So how could they ever have known what he said? It was not only written in a poor imitation of biblical style, ladies and gentlemen, it also undermines the Bible by declaring it insufficient, by adding to and changing many biblical passages by divine revelation, of course. For such reasons as these, it could hardly have been revealed by an angel. Unless that angel, of course, was Lucifer. Its story of the ancient inhabitants of America, the supposed ancestors of the Latter-day Saints, contains twelve major historical errors, easily proven, and which have been absolutely proven over the years. The Book of Mormon is officially recognized by both branches of Mormonism as of equal authority with the Bible, and practically receives honor far beyond the Bible with its adherents. But there is an abundance, ladies and gentlemen, of incontestable evidence that the origin of the Book of Mormon must be sought in Solomon Spaulding's unpublished and stolen novel entitled The Manuscript Found. The Mormons try to obliterate this evidence by referring to another manuscript, The Manuscript Story, by the same Spaulding. They prove that the Book of Mormon is not a copy of the latter manuscript, but of the first. The unknowing are thus convinced that Joseph Smith did not copy from the Spalding manuscript, but the real argument that the Golden Bible is the work of copying and embellishing by Rigdon and Smith remains unanswered. In June of 1831, a revelation commanded the saints to settle in Missouri, which they called the land of Zion, and indeed the Mormon church is Zionist to its core. This land of Zion turned out to be Kirtland, Ohio, and Zion, Missouri, now became headquarters of the movement. But for some pagan reason or other, the Gentile neighbors did not trust the Mormons and accused them of various crimes. The saints 
which the Mormons called themselves, did not hesitate to denounce the Gentiles as enemies of the Lord. When the Safety Bank at Kirtland, a Mormon enterprise, failed in 1838, Smith and his friend Sidney Rigdon fled to Missouri. From Missouri, they were driven away by order of Governor Boggs in 1839. Finding a welcome in Illinois, they erected the city Nauvoo. Here, the prophet Joseph Smith made his biggest display, announcing himself, among other feats, candidate for the presidency of the United States. He was accused of gross immorality, counterfeiting, sheltering criminals in the act of fleeing from justice and other misdeeds. Smith was arrested, but a mob stormed the jail and shot to death both Prophet Joseph and his brother Hiram. In his dying fall from a window above, Joseph Smith was seen to give the Masonic distress signal. Now this was a rather unfortunate occurrence for the anti-Mormon cause, since the prophet now, ladies and gentlemen, became a martyr. And we all know what happens when someone becomes a martyr. Ask the South Africans. And I'll bet if they had it to do all over again, they would never, ever have jailed, <laughs> 40 years ago, a black man who then became a martyr in the cause of the communist movement, and eventually his martyrdom resulted in the downfall of the South African government and the takeover by the communists. Now, it would have been inevitable because racism is immoral. It is wrong. It is indecent. It is unethical. And it would have happened eventually anyway. But it didn't have to happen at the hands of communism. So Joseph Smith became a martyr. When his indictment was in sight and the movement might have died a natural death, hot-headed men with a just grievance killed their cause by immortalizing their opponent and giving his followers a supposed occasion for seeking revenge upon the wicked inhabitants of Gentile America and their descendants. And the hierarchy of the leadership of the Mormon Church today is totally immersed in the creation of the new world totalitarian socialist order. Brigham Young came from England, where he had been proselytizing, and by the force of his personality put several rivals out of commission. He became the recognized leader of the large majority of Mormons. For Young was a strong man, with only 11 days of formal schooling, he went far in this world and became a statesman and leader of no mean proportions. He had a personality that could overcome opposition. He remained true. He remained true. and believed in Joseph Smith all of his life. Brigham Young led the thousands of disciples amid untold suffering until in July 1847 they reached Utah. And on the way, one branch established the first communist settlement in the Long Valley known as Orderville. Utah was then unoccupied Mexican territory. 
Young did not know himself whether the long trek was the right trek or whether Utah was the place where they were really supposed to be, although he convinced the flock that it was. He would say, quote, I will know the place when I see it, end quote. When the outposts of the travelers reached what is now known as Salt Lake City, he announced his one and only revelation. To wit, the Lord had revealed to him that here would be the place where the saints would be free from Gentile American persecution, and this became, so far, the third Zion. <laughs> Each one was supposed to be the place of the new Jerusalem, and Mormons today still look to Nauvoo, Illinois, as the true Zion in America. The Mormons under Young's leadership became excellent pioneers. In fact, all through the western states you will see statues erected to the pioneers. And if you understand the organizations and the peoples who erected these statues, they are really statues and memorials to the Mormon pioneers. There's one right near me in the city of Springerville. For many years, ladies and gentlemen, they had things entirely their own way. The incident of the seagulls who ate the grasshoppers, which had settled upon their first crop, convinced them that the Lord was with them and approved their new venture. Never mind the fact that seagulls had been living and feeding off the life within the salt lake and around the surrounding area long before the Mormons ever showed up upon the scene. Hard pioneering conditions, frugal habits, tithing in the interest of the church made the early Mormons and the church very rich. One of the richest organizations upon the face of this earth today. Soon, missionaries were sent to England and other European countries and even out to the Pacific Islands to fetch converts, especially women. Especially, ladies and gentlemen, women. Young, who had 25 wives, ruled with an iron hand in the colony. Apostates didn't last long. We're usually found somewhere, cut up into many pieces, blood spilled, running to the maximum that blood could be spilled and run because the Mormons believed in blood atonement. Anyone who disagreed with the hierarchy of the leadership of the church was very often found in this condition, drained of blood, parts of their bodies scattered. As to the rule of Brigham Young and the Beehive and Lion's House, two symbols that we've discussed extensively on this broadcast over the last four years, the opinions of his runaway wife, Anne Eliza, and his daughter Susan differ quite a bit. When in 1849, at the close of the Mexican War, Utah became American territory, the Mormons refused to be ruled from Washington. Had they not fled from the United States because of persecution? Followed a long history of diplomatic and other blunders on both sides until finally Young, the first governor of the state of Utah, had to admit another governor? Young, ladies and gentlemen, however, remained the first president of the church. He was assisted, lo and behold, by twelve apostles. You see, it's always the same story. Notorious is the incident of the Mountain Meadow Massacre, when in 1857, an entire group of immigrants on their way from Arkansas to California during the gold rush was murdered in Utah. 
For this, the Mormon John D. Lee was executed by the United States government in 1877. Brigham Young lived to the age of 76 and died in 1877. After the United States obtained greater influence, the Mormons became known as good pioneers, although also as political intriguers. For they still, every person, every adult male, took an oath of revenge against the United States for what had happened in the early history of their church. And up until recently, they still took that oath, and the present leadership of the church, the hierarchy of the leadership of the Mormon church, called the Brethren, took that oath. And it is questionable today, and really unknown, whether they still take the oath. They deny it. They continued to erect costly temples. Among these is the great Ninth or Mesa Temple in Arizona, where Bobo Gritz frequently speaks. It was built in 1927, and here visitors from every state are shown mural paintings portraying the history of Mormonism as twisted by the Mormons. And I mean twisted, ladies and gentlemen. For over the years, they have changed their history and while they claim the Book of Mormon to be the divine translation of the words of God from the golden tablets given to Joe Smith by the angel Moroni, they have changed that text several thousands of times. And anyone can discover this simply by obtaining an early Book of Mormon and comparing it with the Book of Mormon that exists today. Whenever anyone proved that any part of the Book of Mormon was false, fake, or fabricated, the hierarchy of the church simply changed it in order to preserve the religion. In 1937, two more temples at Los Angeles and Idaho Falls were on the program of the church at a total cost of $2,600,000, which in those days was a tremendous amount of money. Similarly, on the hill Camorra in New York, a tall monument now convinces equally large numbers of people of the truth of the Moroni, Urim, and Thummim legend. At the death of George Albert Smith, a distant relative of Joseph, and the eighth prophet, seer, and revelator, in April 1951, the Council of Twelve Apostles chose as his successor David O. McKay, who thus began his administration at the age of 77. He is expected to pay less attention to business than did some of his predecessors and to lay emphasis upon converts. And of course, that is exactly what he did. In 1948, a very astute writer was treated to a lecture given at the end of a conducted tour through the Utah Temple grounds. If you haven't visited the Mormon Temple in Salt Lake City, you should. In this lecture, the tremendous organization of the Mormon Church and the direction of social security was duly stressed. The lady who spoke said, quote, Not only do I and many others freely donate our time to conduct these tours, I have at the present two sons who are on a one-year missionary tour. For all Mormon young men are required to donate from one to two years of their time, going forth reach, preaching the gospel at no other pay than their room and board. Many of these missionary tours are performed in foreign countries. And it's extremely revealing, ladies and gentlemen, that upon completion of those tours and a graduation from Brigham Young University, they frequently return to those same countries as agents of the Central Intelligence Agency, the Office of Naval Intelligence, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, 
and many others. The entire intelligence community today, I can tell you with no hesitation whatsoever, is mainly populated by Mormons recruited from Brigham Young University. And these people, by and large, are in charge of the covert operations, black projects, and intelligence gathering organizations of the United States of America. These missionaries are supported as much as possible by parents and other relatives who must fork out money in addition to their normal expenses and trying to save and put aside in the 10% that they must give to the church. In addition to that, they live on two meals, one Sunday a month, have a meatless day once a month, and the amount so saved is given to the church for distribution among the poor. Now, this custom was begun during the Great Depression in the 1930s, and I have no beef with that. The unemployed donated their time, worked in charity houses where surplus grain and other staples are taken care of. For the work done, these received their keep, and thus the central clearinghouse in Salt Lake City has provided by all means of mutual aid and self-help for all members of the church so as to cast no one at any time on public relief. And that is truly the American way, the way it was for many, many years in this country before Big Brother decided to take care of everyone. Every community had charitable organizations, religious organizations, um, and ladies' clubs, and so on and so forth, who took care of the indigent citizens of their cities or towns, townships, or even in the countryside. And for someone who really, really needed something to eat and a place to sleep, there was always work. So perhaps these means towards social security, together with the enormous zeal of 6,000 Mormon missionaries touring the continent, are largely responsible for the growth of the Utah Mormons to one of the largest religious organizations in the world today. Well, I said 6,000 Mormon missionaries in this country. <laughs> you have no concept of how many there are spread across the world, ladies and gentlemen. And 6,000 is a very conservative number, I must tell you. For they don't really release all of their figures. Almost any system that stresses, as does Mormonism, temporal salvation as well as spiritual salvation is bound to receive a hearing in these days that ask for material results rather than for doctrinal foundation and material results is the great attraction of the Mormon church. If you live in a city that is mainly populated by Mormons, ladies and gentlemen, and you are not a member of the Mormon church, you are not going to make it in your business, and they make no secret of telling you that. Every so often you will be visited by one of the missionaries of the Mormon church who will tell you that they can guarantee the success of your business if you will just come in and be a member of the brotherhood, so to speak. And, of course, if you refuse, you're shunned in politics, in business, and in society. So what? What is it that constitutes Mormonism? In many respects, they operate exactly the same as the Masonic Lodge and many other secret fraternal organizations that exist throughout the world. The Josephite origin of the doctrine, whereas the denials by later Josephites proved to be flimsy upon closer scrutiny, they also are often rather vague and uncertain in fixing the responsibility for polygamy and the time when it was introduced into the church. Fawn M. Brody lists 48 plural wives of Joseph Smith himself. There are then certain differences, ladies and gentlemen, between the teachings of the Brighamites and those of the Josephites. These center chiefly around prophetic succession and, of course, 
that old bugaboo that has haunted them, polygamy. The Josephites claim that the president of the church must be, quote, of the seed of Joseph Smith, end quote. Shook has wittily remarked, It appears to me that if they would split the difference, they would have about the truth, and that is as it now stands. The Josephites have the president, and the Brighamites the church. <laughs> Another convert from the reorganized church, however, repudiates on good grounds the alleged hint of Joseph Smith that his son should succeed him. You see, while the Josephites admittingly were without the president from 1852, the year of their organization, until 1860, when Joseph's son joined their ranks. Where then was the church from 1844 to 1860 if the Josephites are right? Again, the Josephites reject polygamy. But this is just as illogical on their part as is the Utah rejection of the inspired translation of the Bible which the Josephites accept for Joseph Smith himself was a polygamist. The Josephites reject in toto the Adam God doctrine of the Brighamites. But they do believe in many gods and gods with flesh and bones as does the Utah group. Many gods. It's a New Age religion. And the main God? Is it the God of the Bible, as they claim? Not at all, ladies and gentlemen. The God that they talk about is alternately Lucifer, or the first man in the Garden of Eden, Adam. And it depends upon the particular ceremony, and exactly who and what you are quoting. Thus the differences are few. And with the exception of the Josephite rejection of polygamy, insignificant. Both groups hold before the public misleading documents supposed to state their beliefs, but in reality concealing them, for you don't really learn the real beliefs or understand them, just like in the Freemasonic Lodge, the Order of the Rose and Cross, the ancient and military order of the Rose and Cross, the Knights of Malta, the Knights Templars, all of these, you don't learn it until you reach a high level within the church and can be trusted. Then and only then are you told the truth about the God and the ceremony and the meaning of the symbols and the religion of Mormonism. The real beliefs, to quote a lifelong student of Mormonism, are essentially in common as follows. Quote, Smith, a prophet, continuous revelation through him and others, the Book of Mormon and doctrine and covenants as such revelations, the pearl of great price as translated by Smith, parts of which are parts of the inspired translation by him. More revelations yet to come, at least equal to the Bible. Melchizedek and Aaronic priesthoods, gathering, tithing, flesh and bones God, Adam, many gods logically involved in this, but not often advocated by Josephites. Christ and the Spirit, but not Bible conceptions. Sin, a necessity for man. Hell is a saving agency. Salvation through works instead of by faith in Christ, exactly as in the Masonic Lodge. Baptism, which is immersion, essential to salvation. Pre-existence of all men. Apostasy of the Christian Church. Authority. Organization of the Church on their style. Punishment after death. Temporary and measured by sins. Pre-millennialism the Bible defective and practically superseded by their revelations in the Book of Mormon, their president alone the mouthpiece of God and American Pope, etc. In the temple ceremony, when the people call out to God in one instance, 
until recently when this was revealed to the American public, the one that answered was Lucifer. When this became public knowledge through revelations of disaffected Mormons, the ceremony has been changed. And now they deny any involvement with the worship of Lucifer. But ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you that any study of the Mormon religion will reveal that that is a lie. Quite a list of rarities I just gave you, yet one that does not lay claim to completeness. As to that, the Reverend Van Dellen reminds us that their system contains elements borrowed from such widely divergent sources as Christianity, Judaism, Mohammedanism, fetishism, communism, and communism is a big one, and they are major players in the emerging New World Order, which will be totalitarian and socialist in nature. They are in almost complete control of the secret agencies of the United States government which are bringing it about. Manichaeism, Campbellism, Freemasonry, and the hidden mystery religions of Babylon and others. To discuss and trace all these errors one by one, he adds, one ought to write a voluminous book on the doctrine of Mormonism alone, and in it discuss well nigh all religious sects of earlier and later times. For it is indeed next to impossible, ladies and gentlemen, to give a concise view of its many heterogeneous elements because its earlier advocates were anything, anything at all, but theologians. And the Mormon Church has known for many years what is coming, for they have advocated to their adherents to prepare, as I have advocated, for those of you who know nothing about Mormonism or what is coming, to prepare by storing food, by getting ready, by understanding, by moving to a community with people who are like-minded so that you are not in total danger. You may be in some danger at some point, but not total danger that your neighbor is going to come over and kill you for a can of peas. Mormons generally are intelligent people. Most Mormons in their heart know that their doctrine is false. But their religion is a social religion that brings many rewards. Social rewards. Business rewards. Community rewards. Monetary rewards. Recognition. A sense of belonging. And just like the mystery schools, they are told that they are part of the elect. And that they know secrets which the profane will never know. And since the Mormons usually, for the most part, live in mostly Mormon communities, it is not in their best interest ever to admit that they know the falsity of the doctrine. To bring up any criticism of the church. For when they do, it has been well documented, ladies and gentlemen, that those who have the courage enough to question, to tell the truth, to stand up, are ostracized, outcast, People who have claimed undying friendship immediately desert them. They're excommunicated publicly and hounded by the church. All of a sudden, no one patronizes their business and no one will hire them if they need to get a job. Unless, of course, there are businesses in the area which are not Mormon-owned. Throughout the years, many people 
who have done these things have been found dead. In the most bloody fashion, according to the Mormon doctrine of blood atonement. Question. Always question. Never blindly follow anyone. Not me, not your mother, not your minister, not your president, not anyone. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, and God bless each and every single one of you.